becomes a witness to my informality, and I never ever review what I what I say on camera because of that. But I wanted to. Um, I hope that you all will interrupt me and you'll raise your hands and ask questions during the, the talk. Um, I like that, so that it can be a little bit more interactive. Are you all engineers? Anybody here from the School of Public Health? Okay. I saw a flyer went out to my, my the School of Public Health and because I uh, that's where I got my doctoral degree in the School of Environment, Public Health and the Department of Environmental Health Sciences. So I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a clinician, I'm a nurse practitioner. I worked in Oakland for 20 years. I was a, a direct provider to patients at the clinic in Oakland. And then I decided I wanted to go back to school. So my mid-career shift um, came to Berkeley, stuck, got my master's and PhD in environmental health sciences. Initially, I, I wanted to study asthma in urban Latinos exposed to outdoor air pollution because that's where I'd been working and what I'd seen. Um, and I ended up getting um, an interview with my former advisor there, Kirk Smith, and he said, I've got this project in Guatemala um, looking at household air pollution from cook fires and childhood pneumonia. And um, I hadn't really ever experienced that problem. Even though I've lived in Latin America for many years, I mostly lived in urban Lima and not the places where people actually cook with fires um, every day. So I'm not going to talk about that problem, which is a whole exposure assessment side of the equation. I'm going to talk about assessing uh, children um, that are born to women who are pregnant and live in this um, environment. Okay, but um, we'll take a step back first. Um, I just think I, I threw in a few photos here while I was waiting just so you can see the exposure problem. In Guatemala, a lot of people cook over open fires like this. Uh, we, the project we did when I was a grad student here was to do a randomized control trial of that uh, chimney stove and um, follow the infants for um, 18 months to see if, uh, in a randomized control trial whether or not the children had uh, less pneumonia because they were, um, instead of having their mothers cooking over these fires, they had the chimney stove. And that uh, trial is called the RESPIRE study, and it's one of the most famous studies in air, poll in air pollution because they use a randomized stove intervention. Um, where, where we've come since then, because that study was in 2002 to 2004, so 10 years ago. Where are we Welcome today? To Please stand by. The webinar will begin shortly. What's that? Is that I mean, okay. um, we're moving to gas. Okay? So now instead of, we've probably come to the point after measuring a lot of air pollution um, particles from these chimney stoves, we can never get to the point where we can protect health with these kinds of chimney stoves that use wood. So now we're trying to transition people to using LPG gas stoves. Okay, so. Um, in a uh, couple of projects I'm not going to discuss here, some of the bioengineering students in Amy Herr's uh, Bio 192 Senior Capstone Project worked with me on this, pro this problem here, which is how to detect that women are standing near a chimney um, stove when they're cooking, or in one of them in another room, so we can kind of get at their exposure. And then the last group of students helped me work on a problem about how do we measure the gas stove use. So how do we know when the gas is being used appropriately or not? So they work on the flow valve for that. So I'm not going to present those projects. I'm going to talk about the third team um, that developed something to assess uh, preterm infants. That comes at the end of the talk. So first a few definitions. Um, uh, we're there's low birth weight, which is less than 2,500 grams. Uh, doesn't matter about what gestational age they have. We have another problem, uh, which is preterm birth, which is born before 37 weeks. Um, gestational age is something that's measured during pregnancy. Um, in normal gestation, a baby that's born between 38 and 42 weeks is considered um, the appropriate gestational age. And um, there's another thing that we have, which is called small for gestational age, which means that the infant is tiny for the gestational age that they're at. Okay, less than 10 percentile. So we have all these different definitions. Is the baby low birth weight? Is the baby small for gestational age? Is the baby preterm? And all of these things mix in a graph right here where you can basically plot how many weeks did the baby 
oh, and did the baby stay inside the mom before the baby was born versus how much did the baby weigh? And you can plot this all out. And when you, um, this little blue blob that looks like the state of Maine is actually the, sp the space where the baby is just right. Right gestation, right weight. Above or below, on either side of that, we've got, we can run into some problems. Even if you have a very heavy baby, you can have problems. Doesn't it depend on what gives us in the mother's um, structure to like how much, uh, how big the mother is? Yes, yeah, so, honestly. yes. So in countries like Guatemala, where women are very small, they do have small babies, and the, and the they may, act, we have a, actually a high rate of low birth weight. Um, up to 25% of the babies are born low birth weight. Um, so low birth weight may not be the thing that we want to look at because maybe a baby that's 2,300 grams in Guatemala is a fine birth weight for that. But preterm is preterm. Babies born too early, there's never a, an explanation or a situation where that would be okay. So um, that's a nice point to make. Um, and so my question is, you know, what do we care about most? Should we care about low birth weight? Should we care about preterm birth? And it really comes down to how are we going to measure it? What are we going to do to measure it? Because people that are thinking of creating devices to measure these babies that are born in the field, um, in the homes. So these are two traditional birth attendants carrying an electronic weighing scale on their head. We did a study where we went to the home births and measured these babies in the homes to get a really accurate measure. So um, that's easy to measure, right? You can measure birth weight very easily. Um, what about preterm birth? And that's the preterm infants is what I want to spend time on. But So lo low birth weight. What is the burden of disease of low birth weight? 20 million babies are born a year that are low, low birth weight around the world. 20 million. Okay? But 96% of them are in low resource countries, developing countries. 4% in you know the U.S. and Europe and high income countries, 96 percent in the low income countries, and maybe that's because the women are constitutionally small. Uh, maybe it's, but it's a problem in developing countries. So we want to measure babies. We can um, create these little devices, and each one has its pro and con. It's got to be very, very cheap. Uh, traditional birth attendants that deliver babies at home have to carry them around in their their backpacks. They have to be able to read them, and a lot of them can't read. So um, this device here is a you you hang the baby on a sling, and it just measures in three colors: red, yellow, and green. It doesn't even give you the weight. Um, the same with this one up here at the top. It was developed by Path from Seattle. Um, and then this one has a dial, so you can actually read the numbers. And this is kind of more like what we use uh, here with us, an electronic scale. Um, problems with calibration, problems with just getting these to women. Um, but it's, it's an easy thing to do. It's easy to train women to do it. The problem is getting it out there into the field. So what about preterms? So maybe that's what we want to measure. So most of the little birth weight infants are either preterm, small for gestational age, or both, okay? And approximately of those 20 million low birth weight babies, 15 million are preterm, okay? So th th that's the problem, is the, the preterm infants. And one million um, deaths in neonates are due to prematurity globally, okay? We've done a lot to reduce infant mortality through programs like vaccination programs and um, measure, uh, getting kids to go to clinics and treatments for diarrhea and pneumonia. But the children that are born at home prematurely, they die at home, they don't get seen. And so we've seen this infant mortality, the pie has all of a sudden changed, it's shifted to 40% of infants uh, die during the neonatal period of the first month of life. So you've been able to shrink the pie, but now that peak, that that segment of the pie is almost 40% of it is from the, in the first month of life. So that's where we have to to get to the infants. So how do we assess uh, prematurity? Well, there's several different ways. And you could do an ultrasound during pregnancy. The earlier, the better. Um, there's a problem in the areas where we work that people don't. 
actually show up clinical care until they're halfway through the pregnancy and they're visibly pregnant. So they're not coming in the first trimester when the ultrasound is the most accurate. Um, but the ultrasound is the best, okay, especially in the first trimester. And then the last menstrual period, which people sometimes remember, sometimes they don't, sometimes they guess. Um, this is another method that people can use, uh, but when people can't read or write, don't use calendars, it's a big guess. So we about 25% of the people in any in our studies in Guatemala just they don't know. They know the month, they know the year, but that's it. Um, and fungal height is just measuring in pregnancy when you go to the prenatal clinic. So we're left with a problem because a lot of these things, ultrasounds aren't available. People don't remember their their last menstrual period, and they don't go to prenatal care. They don't get their fungal height checked. So it's hard to assess in the beginning uh, during pregnancy. But at delivery, we have other methods. So we can examine the newborn. We asked the traditional birth attendants in a study I did, these are women that are, they're not midwives. Traditional birth attendants are people that are like trained by calling. They're, they may be, somebody said you need to deliver babies, and then they asked around, and kind of got a little informal training, maybe from their mom or as a friend, and they just start delivering babies. So these um, women, when we asked them, what is what does a preterm baby look like? They said it's small and it has a bluish color. It's not a good color. That's that was their assessment of a preterm infant. There's other things you can do to examine the newborn. Um, there's two methods that are reliable and valid within about two weeks, um, and I'll show you a picture of what you do with those. And this one is actually something interesting that's. Being, but uh, there's actually a technology, a, a, a device that's being developed through funding through the Gates Foundation using um, a smartphone to look into the infant's eye to see the vessels in the eye. Um, so things like that uh, are interesting um, and in development. So ultrasound. This was actually a training we did in Guatemala with the physicians and nurses at a clinic. And this is a Sonocyte portable um, ultrasound. It's this big. You could drop it on the floor. It still works. You don't want to do that, just in case. Um, but it's a little, little ultrasound that works pretty well. And so we've been trying to get these into the field for people to use them. But they have to go to the clinic. We're not training traditional birth attendants to do this. It's, a little bit more sophisticated than that. And then you just can get an image and you can plot the crown rump length of an infant and then there's an algorithm you can see what their gestational age is. And the new Ballard is the one that we actually, yes, um, there's 12 criteria that you have to, yes. So can I ask a question for yes. this one? Yes. So based on the lens, like what is oh, the lens? lens related to the, um, Prematurity and how is that correlated? Right. Um, so the lens of the eye, you mean? No, because oh, the length. Of the, length. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you. Were, I, I thought you were about the, the eye exam, which mm -hmm. is actually looking the lens. Um, well, they done. They plotted enough babies in small. You know, um, the embryo and then the little everything that's up until about uh, 12 weeks is a standard size. They, everybody grows the same. Then as you get more and more pregnant, depending on maternal nutrition, right, the babies can change in their weight. But at this point, it's pretty standard. If you get, uh, if you get this plotted distance here of like, you know, 15 millimeters, it corresponds to a gestational age almost perfectly. Um, so that's just based on thousands of ultrasounds that they've created an algorithm where they know. And there's other measurements they do, like head circumference, um, femur length, um, and then they create it, they have a formula and plot it out, calculate the gestational age. So that's just one of the measurements that they do. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, maybe I missed it during the first slides that you presented, but you seem to give to, to the weight, but I only thought that when you have prematurity, it's because the, the problem is that they are not mature enough or they are not organs. What about if uh, his weight is, is underweight, but still like 
developed enough to survive? Or is it something inherent to the weight? Um, Why focusing more on the weight and not like for organs? Because the, usually the weight, cor so if you have a, a weight of a thousand grams, which is like you know, butter, like four cubes of butter, and that's a thousand grams, that's a pre premature baby. Right, that, that's just, you know it. There's no way that you get a mature baby that weighs that little, say with 1,500. So if you look at the very low birth weights, like 1,000 or 1,500, those are preterm infants. But that 2,500, maybe 2,000 grams, that's where it could actually be a baby that's perfectly mature, but it um, is low birth weight. And the reason why that happens is because when the, when the baby's developing, either the mother is not eating enough, or there's problems with the placenta, or something is going on when the baby just doesn't grow properly. So that's why people measure low birth weight, because it's easy to measure. And anybody can do it with a little bit of training. But we shouldn't really be focusing so much on that now. Everyone's moving to preterm. You got to look at the, the, the maturity of the baby, not its weight. Um, so when you look at, um, this scale is a scale of the maturity of a baby. Okay, it's called the New Valor. And so what it, it's looking at is neuromuscular maturity, and it's looking at physical maturity. So you know, looking at the eyes, the ears, um, the skin, um, and then also doing things with the baby, like seeing how um, t how much muscular tone they have. Okay, because you've seen. Uh, uh, very premature infants are kind of just, they're just loose. They, have, they just kind of flop, okay? So these are things that we, we actually trained um, traditional birth attendants to do. Um, up there are two traditional birth attendants in the hospital are practicing with a little cloth baby. And we taught them this, these skills in the hospital and then we did them at home births. Um, and it was, first of all, um, very labor intensive. And then over time, they lose their skills. You have to keep retraining them. It just wasn't easy enough to, to say that we can actually use this with any accuracy, you know, years from. A little bit too, too challenging. So that was one of the things. I mean, training is great. I still think we need to train everybody we possibly can. But this, this particular labor intensive method didn't really yield much a year after the training. Um, so why I showed you the piece of the pie, and basically 17% of neonatal deaths are due to prematurity, okay? Um, and here are the other causes. So between zero and, and five years, when a children die of, most of them die during the neonatal period, and of them, 17% are uh, preterm birth, okay? Um, and then, um, yeah. And then there's the other birth asphyxia and other, other complications of delivery. So the leading cause of newborn deaths globally is preterm birth. And here are a lot of the, mm -hmm. so for the prematurity uh, births. So I know you talk about in developing country and that is one of the key reasons for the baby deaths, but how is it in the developed country? For example, in the US, if you have the premature and is it also that the death rate? I have slides on that. Okay. I'm going to show you. Um, we're going to talk about that. Okay. Yeah, um, because it's very interesting what happens in the U.S. So I, I do want to pay some attention to that too. Um, so here's some complications from preterm birth. So the baby, because the baby's not mature, right? The baby has problems with hypothermia. So the baby doesn't have enough fat stores or glycogen or anything to keep to shiver and keep itself warm. So it gets cold, low sugar, hypoglycemia, um, problems breathing, all kinds of problems breathing because the lungs aren't mature. Um, and then other things like that are difficult to feed, they can't suck, so they can't breastfeed. Um, and later on they can develop um, problems with hearing, um, with eyesight, so um, blindness due to there's a debate. Um, the eye, the eye isn't perfectly formed, um, but plus we give it pre preterm infants lots of oxygen, 
which kind of ruins their lenses, so then they become blind from the, the treatment of prematurity. Um, anybody in here was a preemie? No? Sometimes people are like, oh, I was a preemie. Afterward, they come up, I was a preemie. So, <laughs> um, so, uh, so lots of problems. And the solutions, and if you think about what we can do in um, this country versus what we can do in a, in a country like Guatemala on this list, keep the baby warm and dry, keep, keep the baby swaddled, um, resuscitation, which is something that you could train people to do uh, that deliver babies at home, promote breastfeeding, cord care, these things right here basically have to be in the hospital to get that done to you. So a lot of this is things that preterm infants need to be identified and referred to a hospital because these treatments are more complex than can be done at home. I'm going to keep the camera challenge and moving over here now. Um, so where is the biggest burden of preterm birth? And this uh, is showing it in two different ways. The first way is showing um, the highest, oh, it got, it chopped, got chopped off at the top. So at the top, it's just the number of preterm births. So of course, number one is, is India, and number two is China being the countries with the most population, Nigeria also. Pakistan, so these are the sheer numbers of preterm birth. And then the, by, by percentage, then it changes in mostly countries in Africa and um, Indonesia. So um, over 15% preterm birth in those countries. And the United States um, actually uh, had 500,000 of the preterm birth, deaths for prematurity are in the United States. It's 500,000. Um, deaths to uh, pre premature birth. And it's a very surprising death statistics. Yeah, it's very it's very surprising because I'm sorry, I, I said that wrong, it's not deaths, it's five hundred thousand preterm births. And not deaths. Sorry. Yeah, that would be no. Five hundred thousand <laughs> births. Um, and here you go with the the stats for the United by state by state. Get a question? Yeah, I'm curious. Um, why is Indonesia uh, so high for premature birth rate compared to other countries nearby in Pakistan? I don't know. I don't know why Indonesia would have such a high rate. I don't know whether it's um, I, I actually that's something. Usually, it's related. Some of some of it is related to poverty and services. Mm -hmm. So access. I mean, um, to prenatal care. Um, identifying early and getting proper care. So I don't actually know much about why Indonesia would have such a high rate. Um, it could also be the opposite is that they're very good at measuring <laughs> prematurity. Mm -hmm. So in our studies in rural Guatemala where we did ultrasounds on, on 200 pregnant women, mm -hmm. they say that the, uh, well, let's see, we can see, well, we can't because that other map's no good. But um, the preterm birth rate in Guatemala is about 11% nationally, that's what they report, and we measure 22% because we were getting at the women born that were delivering their babies in their houses and we had ultrasounds. So it was double the rate. So within each country you're going to have higher and lower rates, this is just the average, but I don't know why Indonesia. So what strikes you here from this map? Very high in the south. Very high in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Um, very low in California. If we looked at it by um, by race, ethnicity, the United States, um, African American um, have thirteen point four percent preterm birth, and so that's higher than, above and beyond any other racial ethnic group. And approaches some of the rates that in some of the other countries that we see that we would consider intervening on. So what might be the, um, the causes? So how can we just explain this? Oh, um, how can we explain this? I, actually, I was talking um, to you before um, we started that there's an interesting 
U-shaped curve of preterm birth in the United States. And that's that the very, very rich have high rates of preterm birth. Um, why is that? Anybody have an idea? Do they wait longer? Do they wait longer to pregnancy? Yeah. So older age is one risk factor. C-sections, C-section. Yeah. So medical indications. So higher C-section rates. And there's one other really big, big thing that causes preterm birth. You have two things. Assisted, assisted fertility. So people that get, um, that, what was that? Because they can't, they can't. Yeah, I'm just curious because some models there are just way too thin. <laughs> oh yeah, too thin. Too yeah, yeah under, underweight is a problem. Yeah. But it's more that people want, people delay pregnancy and then need to go to fertility clinics to get expensive treatments to have babies. And so when you have when you have these fertility treatments, you're more likely to have twins and triplets, and that increases your risk of preterm birth. So the ones that can that are going through fertility treatments and are older age, um, and then want cesareans or because they're you know for whatever reason need them but also maybe get cesarean sections more than the poor who have a different set of risk factors. So I'll go over those in a minute, but first I wanted to just say that there um, are three types of preterm labor, and one of them is this medically indicated. That's the, the physician says, you know what, it looks like you're having complications, or your infant's having complications, we're going to do a cesarean. So 30% of our preterm birth in the United States is due to medically indicated and not always medically necessary, but mostly they are. Um, and then spontaneous are these two other kinds of where if the woman shows up and says, I've started to have contractions or my membrane's ruptured, which is like in the movies you see. Um, that scenario, um, those are 70% of preterm labor. Um, and these are basically kind of the pathophysiologic reasons for preterm birth. Um, and I'm not really going to go through them all, but there's hormonal reasons, which could be stress-related, either maternal or maternal. <coughs> um, there's inflammation and infection. There's problems with the placenta. Um, there's problems with having twins and triplets, and your uterus is really distended, and that can cause preterm birth. And then cervical um, insufficiency. So cervix can't, you know, it has to stay closed so the baby can't come out, is insufficient. So these are the major reasons for spontaneous preterm birth. And here's just a nice little picture that illustrates it in a different way. Um, the uterine clock, we actually don't have a clock in our uterus, um, but <laughs> these are the kinds of things people are looking at is that there's some kind of trigger to the clock that just sets the cascade. Um, so these are kind of uh, bioengineering issues, I suppose. These are things like, what, what exactly are these mechanisms that trigger um, and uh, what sets these hormones cascading and cause preterm birth? So um, these are just, just a graphical representation. And these are kind of the list of things that increase your um, risk for preterm birth. So, there's non-modifiable risk factors like we talked about African American race or your age, which you can't change, um, or um, a uh, history of preterm birth. Um, and then there are modifiable risk factors. These are things we could counsel women on. Stop smoking, um, get some prenatal care, um, and treat infections and different um, methods. And I actually, what's very interesting is that these two uh, so working too hard at the end of your pregnancy um, or having a lot of personal stress is, is, a, is something that people are looking at at UCSF is what is the role of stress on hormones and preterm birth, um, which I find very interesting. I think, you know, it's like mind over matter, but this is your mind can actually trigger this. Um, so should we work on low-tech or high-tech solutions to assess and address preterm birth? It's fun to work on high-tech solutions, I think. You probably work on high-tech solutions. I think that's what's interesting about um, the pairing of the um, medical, the kind of the medical world and the engineering world is that, you know, uh, the people that work in healthcare, we're always thinking about the people and it's, you know, you've got to train, you've got to do something to people, it's behavior. 
And then there's this whole mechanistic side of, of the problem of preterm birth or high blood pressure that, that solving these problems actually require initially, I think, a high-tech solution, but with the goal that then it be transferable to the low-tech environment. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few of those. This is a picture I took of an infant in Bangladesh and they, in, a, in a nursery that they didn't have all the things that the infancy of this baby is not preterm, um, but was getting light therapy. Um, so whether we're going to choose high-tech or low-tech solutions depends on available resources um, and what we can actually hope to uh, transfer into low resource settings. I like this photo because it's a contrast in San Francisco. Um, so what about, what, do, we, do we look at the resources in terms of how much money people make? So we have here, I'm going to show you in a couple of slides the differences between places like the United States and Norway, India, Guatemala, and Rwanda to compare and contrast how much people have to pay for health care, what percentage um, is spent. So do we look at the percent of the gross domestic product that's spent on health care? So you can see here in the United States, you've all heard, spends a whopping 17% of our budget on health care. And um, India spends 4%. Uh, the next, um, and Rwanda actually is a kind of a miracle story because they're spending so much on improving their health care system through low tech solutions. Um, but they've actually now crept up above the world average, which is remarkable um, for a country that doesn't have a lot of resources. So does this indicate that, so I guess I'm just wondering, does it take into account an efficiency in the system? So are we just spending more money for no, maybe no reason as compared to Norway? Or are we like really doing twice as good in terms of resource allocation? Well, we're not doing twice as good because our, our preterm birth rate and um, is higher. I mean, it should be that if we had, for instance, with preterm birth, we would have, if we were spending our resources correctly, I think we wouldn't see the racial ethnic disparities that we see. Um, I think there's maybe, it's, it's complicated. And I'm on camera, so I'm not gonna say anymore. <laughs> no, but what, what, do you, what, do, what do other people think? I think resource distribution in the US may also be very homogeneous. Yeah. Um, and are we spending it on preventative care? Or are we spending it on tertiary care? So the super high tech um, things in hospitals versus the low tech things in clinics. Um, but this number definitely is pretty striking. It's, I mean, the United States is the highest in the world. And then the next lowest that I could find was Norway. But then actually, I plotted Rwanda on this graph, and Rwanda had, was just has crept up in the past couple of years, it's at 11.1%. How much do we spend per capita in terms of dollars? Now, Norway spends more dollars per capita than the US. Norway has a lot of money, right? Well, they did anyway, because of the oil. Um, and then countries like Rwanda, spends 11% of its budget, actually only spends $71 per person. So it's just how are you going to look at it, by percent or by, uh, by total? Um, so how, how we're going to prioritize it may not just be based on um, how much money we have to spend on health, but on priorities, right? So if you're in a poor country like Guatemala, maybe you know, you've got competing needs <coughs> that maybe we need to focus on agriculture and food security and not move it into the healthcare. So you've always got these competing interests when you only have um, the X number of dollars to spend. Um, so it depends on your priorities. And not only that, not just is it agriculture or is it the military or is it um, healthcare, but then where are we gonna put it? Are we gonna put it out there um, in the houses where we're talking about preventing pregnancies in the first place, which happens to be the number one way to protect prevent preterm birth, right? Because uh, uh, family planning, don't get pregnant, no preterm birth. So that could be a cheap way to take care of it, right? Um, then we have, we could put it into antenatal care visits. So we could really try to get women to come to prenatal visits 
um, and incentivize them. There's several countries that pay women to go to clinics to get prenatal care. They give them cash to get them to come. Uh, or do we put it put it onto the you know the hospital? Do we want to develop the technologies in the hospital, like cheap incubators, um, cheap um, uh, the machines that take oxygen, room oxygen from the air and concentrate it? So things that devices we can actually use in the hospital where we hope these preterm infants go might not be bad, right? So where are we going to put the money that we have? So um, I, I found this fact interesting. So globally, nearly 85% of preterm babies are born between 32 and 37 weeks. So these are the babies that are they can survive. Um, and they do not need intensive care to survive. They need low-tech. Low, low solutions. Um, and so I was just trying to think about high resource versus low resource, high tech versus low tech, like all the solutions you could do for somebody um, that you suspect had a preterm, um, was at risk for preterm birth. And it's cut off, so you can't even see the top. I don't know why. I can see it on my screen, but it's okay. It's the projector, maybe. We're not going to read it anyway. Um, but up at this, in this corner, okay, if you really want, what you, if you have a preterm infant, um, what can you do? You can try to reduce the number of C-sections that aren't medically indicated. You can not give everybody fertility treatments that wants them, if, even if they're at high risk. But that's high tech, high resource, right? Like maybe here in the United States. And over here, we have the things that we could do, little money, little technology, and it would help a lot of low-resource countries. Um, and over here, I put my provide clean cook stoves to avoid exposure to air pollution from cooking fires, because that's what I study. Um, and I think it's, it, it's we have to work with low-resource countries on this, but it does involve a technology. Maybe not a high technology, but a technology, so it's a little more costly. So I'm just going to focus on this bottom over here. And what I'm really just going to, um, you're kind of coded. Red is what you do before the baby's born, and then the, the, the black is what you would do after the baby's born, okay? Um, any questions on this? Um, I have a question. Do the Arabs mean that for a low-resource, low-technology area, you're framing for it to become a low-resource, high-technology, and then for a high-tech, high-resource, you want it to become a high-technology? No. The arrows should not be there. Okay. Ignore the arrows. Yeah, no, that's just some PowerPoint glitch. <laughs> um, but for instance, so here in a low resource setting, these are things that, I mean, that I, I did this so that I'm thinking, it, I kind of was kind of trying to plot what things you could do in a low resource setting. If you had a hospital, the things that you want to give those infants, um, antibiotics, and this is this um, continuous positive airway pressure, which is helping the infants breathe when they're preterm, and oxygen. These are things that we, we know. And there's some really cool CPAP machines. I don't know if anybody if you saw it. This is somebody who just was at their home and thinking about this problem and created something with a, like a drinking straw and a soda bottle. I mean, it wasn't that simplistic, but coming up with a very cheap, machine of like this is something that um, would be great for, for hospitals in low resource countries that really need that and can't afford uh, for, you know hundreds of thousands of dollars for equipment. They need low tech solutions or cheap solutions at least. So the birth attendance, this is, I talked about the infants that are born at home and you can see here um, this is actually the inverse of infants born at home. This is first attended by skilled health professionals. So that's midwives, physicians, Norway 100%, United States 99.3. Um, this includes midwives, so I don't know what the 0.7, uh, where, where there are. Um, but, um, and then you go down to the country that I work in, Guatemala, where half are born in the hospital, half are born at home. So this is a birth at home I, I attended. Um, this is a traditional birth attendant, um, and after the baby was born, um, in these settings, this is this is the house. 
This is the, these are the walls, this is the floor of the bedroom. There is no equipment, they don't have any resources, alcohol, gloves, nothing, okay? Um, and if something were to happen in the home, it's difficult to transport these infants to the hospital because there's no cars or trucks. So the kinds of complications that you might see in that setting, uh, the only thing that we could expect traditional birth attendants to do is to know to wrap the baby up and swaddle them, which they do, um, to resuscitate or use a bulb syringe to try to, but it's very limited. They don't have a lot of uh, capability of really doing a good resuscitation. Um, and these are the two other things that the infants could do, the traditional birth attendants could do, is clean the cord, um, and promote breastfeeding, even in a preterm infant, trying to get the infant to breastfeed is important. So now in the, uh, I, I want to end in a few minutes, but I just wanted to go over a few of these technologies, which are, I found really interesting. These are all funded by the Gates Foundation in the past two years. Um, the first one is, uh, de they're developing, and these are all, you can't find in PubMed, you, it's like you can't find anything beyond the paragraph that describes what they're doing, so I don't have pictures or things like that. But this first one is they're um, trying to develop a smartphone-based mobile ultrasound device to determine gestational age by measuring the diameter of the fetal cerebellum. So ultrasound through the head to measure the, the size of the brain. Um, and they, this was to be used for traditional birth attendants, people that are of limited um, literacy. Um, and then this one, which is, um, is de developing a device to measure epidermal properties of the skin. Um, and basically, preterm infants have like almost translucent, transparent, uh, jelly, kind of gelatinous skin. And so I, I suppose what they're trying to do is, well, not that gelatinous, but, you know, they don't have hair and it's kind of see-through. And so I, this sounds very interesting to me that you'd have something you could just kind of put it on there and it could tell from the type of skin that the baby had, um, the gestational age. Um, and then they said something about that they were going to make one of those 3D printer type things that could make these devices cheaply. So I thought that was cool. Um, the next one is a newborn face and foot analysis to determine gestational age. And this, um, I actually found a video of him. He got, uh, he's doing a randomized control trial where they're taking videos of the face and the foot of the infant. And then the thing that I wasn't quite sure about is they're actually, you know, poke them and they look at the grimacing. So it's kind of, it's whether or not they feel pain, I was like, mm. but, um, you know, they just do a little, just to see if the infant reacts. Um, and then from those grimaces, the facial muscles and the reflex of the feet develop an algorithm that can say what gestational age that infant is. So that would also be a very simple thing. If you re can really do it through video and through trial and error, then you can create something that then somebody could actually just poke the kid and it goes, oh, that kid's 32 weeks, you know, it'd be very interesting. Um, and this one is uh, actually a, a person at UCSF and then somebody at Ottawa Hospital. This is more for our setting. Um, all newborns get a heel stick and then they take a little blot, one drop of blood, they put it on a cardboard paper and it measures, um, depending on the, the state, up to 59 metabolic um, profiles that indicate metabolic disease or problems with uh, glucose. Um, and this study, these studies are trying to predict, like using super learner methods, how they can take hundreds of thousands of these blood spots and from that determine gestational age, which sounds kind of interesting, but um, not quite sure how that would apply in a low resource setting because they don't do all this testing. Oops. Are the system used in, in routine or are they under development? These are all under development. This is like um, through, through the Gates, the Gates um, grand challenges, or where you write a two-page proposal about a crazy idea that you have that actually is not that crazy because you prototyped it or you know how it works. But they like ideas that are risky, um, and then these, so these are the ones where. 
people have gotten this initial, I think it's $100,000 for two years. Um, so some of them are very, just very quantitative, actually just kind of running through a lot of data. And some of them are actually developing devices. Uh, and this was the one, this was the one with the smartphone um, to look in the eye of the infant to look at the blood vessels. And this is a really fuzzy picture, picture that I downloaded from the internet, but it just shows that um, as the infant develops more, the blood vessels disappear. So they're very vascular when they're very tiny, and then the blood vessels kind of become less vascular, um, so or less pronounced. So that also could be pretty interesting if you had a smartphone and an infant, you just take a picture of their eye and then you can all of a sudden detect those um, uh, by gestational age. So I'm going to show you just, oh yes, oh, it's a good time to ask questions. I'm oh, sorry, Is, are smartphones accessible in um, Guatemala? Uh, kind of. I think um, in uh, people like physicians have them, maybe nurses. <laughs> Um, they, they, but they're mostly these phones that you can text and take pictures, but they're not connected to the internet. Um, in Rwanda, one of their big improvements that they did is they gave all the community health workers telephones, but not smartphones. They gave them phones so they could, you know, if they were at home and saw a problem, they could call the clinic and the clinic would come out. So just giving people phones, everybody has a phone. Uh, has a cellular phone in Guatemala, but not many have smartphones. Okay, so many of these products were for diagnosing or, um, or assessing preterm birth, so is the point to identify when a it is a baby and then to take proper medical steps afterwards? Yeah, to refer. Okay. To refer. Because the problem right now is they don't know who was preterm and who's normal. They don't. Okay. And one of the traditional birth attendants I worked with said that, you know, this baby was born small and blue. Um, and uh, in, in this part of Guatemala, they use uh, wood-fired sauna baths. And um, so, you know, she wanted to warm the baby up. And so she took it into this smoky sauna bath, you know, which is not what you want to do if you have a premature infant. So that kind of thing about if you had a, some simple diagnostic that people could say, oh, this is preterm, I need to make my phone call to somebody to get the baby to the clinic or the hospital. It, it, it is much improved in Guatemala, the rural area we work. There are ambulances, there are cars, there are clinics, there are only 24 hours. So, um, but so it's identifying to refer, that's the key. What I wanted to do is just show you the project of the students that were in Amy's um, bioengineering class. They, it was their senior capstone project and it's something that they developed which was really cool but you know they were undergraduate seniors and then they graduated and they so it stayed in prototype form but I just wanted to show you an idea that they worked through with me that was really neat so um, these were the, uh, the four um, students and this it was so it was over three and a half years ago and they called this InfoScreen which is the tool that they developed in consultation with me so we, we, what we were trying to look at is another, the ACBAR test, which every infant that's born in a hospital in the U.S., they do ACBARs on them at one in five minutes to see if they have any problems. Not necessarily a, a prematurity, but just neurologic problems. Um, so they do these different things. Um, the ACBAR test, it just looks at are they really relaxed, or are they tense, are they moving their limbs together, um, do they grimace to pain, what's their pulse, what's their respiration and how active they are. So it just measures those functions and you get assigned a score. So I don't know, I, when I worked as a nurse in, a, in, a, in the labor and delivery, some people say, what's their act bars? You know, the first thing they ask is if you say 10-10, you're like, oh, my baby's fine. Okay, so that's kind of an, a really fast screening tool. Um, but it does, you do need to take pulse and you need to count respiration. So that may be a little bit more technical for some that are trained. So usually, um, so what is it correlated with? It, it, you can definitely it's affected by gestational age. You have a preterm infant; they're going to they're going to react differently. Um, if the mother it, it, um, came in um, using substances, 
the infant which would screen um, poorly on the app bar. Uh, it's correlated with the need for resuscitation, so the infants that are breathing um, correctly. And this low score is also associated with increased mortality. So this is, the, this is what they developed. They're, they developed actually two devices. The first one is kind of like a little abacus. So this was something that the traditional birth attendants would use. They would kind of move the little, the little cubes over and they would count up how many cubes were on the right and then it would assign a score. Zero to five is red, that's, um, we have a problem because the lower the score, the worse it is. So this was kind of a little prototype that they did. But this one was more of an electronic device that I'll show you. They made a little video on it. This was something that they hoped would then, you could actually work out the electronics so that it would signal to a clinic or do some way of communicating um, with people to, to actually do something about um, uh, referring the infant. So here's the little abacus. Um, so here you can see the score is five because there are five cubes here. One, two, three, four, five. This was a uh, cry. So they tested it with, to see. We understand that probably because we have phones that make the little, the little um, voice thing, but for people that maybe don't know what that is because they don't have that button, they tested all these buttons with people in the field. We sent them down and we sent prototypes to Guatemala and then they would talk to us about whether they thought that that would work or not. Um, and here's the training product, which was an electronic version of that. Um, and uh, it does require batteries, but we use batteries all the time. And then there was a pulse sensor. So I'm going to show you a little video they made. semester-long project that they had to come up, um, come up with. But you ta that, right? You both ta the course, so you know. Um, and uh, it, was a, it was a really interesting process for them to think about what kind of device. They originally thought about doing a, um, trying to come up with a baby scale. But then when they looked at the baby scales, they thought maybe that's not it. But this little app bar screener um, is something that they didn't take it to the next level, but I think it's impossible. Something like this kind of device is something interesting that could be applied. So, any questions? I was wondering if you observed in places with kind of more extreme climates, like very high altitude or very hot or very cold, do you see differences in uh, your term birth rates? Um, well, there there have been study um, there have been studies done in the U.S. Um, and there's a study ongoing right now about climate change, high temperature, and increasing preterm birth and stillbirth. So if you have enough hundreds of thousands of birth data in California, you can, it is associated with extreme weather, yeah. Another thing uh, preterm birth has been associated with is in a couple of studies with um, low maternal nutrition. So in times when there's crops, so people that live on a cycle of planting and harvesting, um, when there's not much food and they, they're very, very, you know, they're pregnant, they can, it's a risk for preterm birth. So you could also see in that, so it's drought areas um, with food shortages. It's a big study during World War II, it's called the Dutch famine study. And um, in Holland, there, there was a period where they had no food and all the pregnant women were experiencing famine and there was all this increase of preterm birth and that was the first time they said interesting famine associated with preterm birth um, and so that's been found in studies in, in drought stricken areas of africa specifically any other questions i'm curious when you're working on uh, cook stove interventions and different kinds of cook stoves 
what kind of cultural barriers there were in terms of switching what people were cooking with in the home and what worked to get around those? Yeah, so the, um, when we went from the open fire to that chimney stove, they loved it. Because the chimney stove was something that they used and they wanted, but they couldn't afford it. Um, and so there was no problem with the chimney stove. The only problem was that um, people, they cook, um, they cook large pots of food and they burn their garbage. And so they would go outside, continue to use an open fire to burn their garbage and cook these large pots of food that they feed the animals with. So they had dual fire, so we call that stove stacking. And there's, I was actually, she was an electrical engineer, she graduated from here, um, who's a couple of years ago, but she was developing temperature sensors to put on, not develop, she started to implement them. You put them on all the stoves and you can measure the stove stacking. So when people use this stove and that stove and the other stove. So there are barriers to any, any stove. Um, now we're working on gas stove and that's gonna be the biggest the new technology is actually using gas. And we've um, started to do a little bit of piloting and we've done focus groups. Um, so we're trying to address um, some of the barriers. So I got a Grand Challenges Canada grant to, to roll out gas stoves in, a, in an urban area and people are afraid of gas. Um, any of you ever used LPG gas? They're little um, tanks and you have to, they have a valve and you have to snap them on and off. It's like, well, like your barbecue grill, right? It's the same thing, propane tank. You know, you're always kind of afraid, like, I don't know how to turn it on or off or disconnect it. There's a little moment of, so we know that exists. So we're working with um, uh, peer educators on how to, to do, how to use the stove properly. Um, but we're pretty confident that from our pilot work that people love it because this means that women aren't gathering wood for several hours a day or their children are gathering wood. And then to start a fire takes an hour to get a good fire going. So you're saving women's time, women's energy. So um, we feel like it's gonna be a major a major life change if um, people accept the way food tastes, because they say it tastes different. Um, and if you get the right kind of gas stove, because uh, if you give them a little two burner stove and it can't support that big pot of animal food, they're gonna go use their open fire. So we just put in a big grant um, in for four countries to for gas stove adoption should we get it it's going to be 4800 households in four countries cool. getting gas stoves and following them um, for the price of gas they, that may be high there yeah i hope it, yeah i hope the gas doesn't go up we could have a budget problem right now it's so affordable um, these L the LPG tanks are pretty affordable. In India, for instance, is one of the countries that we're, we're working with. Their, they have a national government program to try to roll out gas stoves. Um, so there we have actually kind of policy behind. So people subsidize stoves and things like that. So, or subsidize the gas and makes it more affordable. So that's the next talk in a couple of years. I'll tell you how that worked. Awesome. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.